really excited that you all registered for this webinar today. I have more than 10 years of experience working with a wide variety of laboratory animal species, and today my colleagues and I are going to tell you a little bit about the incredible environmental enrichment programs that laboratories like ours provide for our animals. The ultimate goal of environmental enrichment programs is to promote the health and well-being of our animals with stimulating activities, toys, treats, exercise, and opportunities to socialize, all which allows them to express behaviors that are typical for their species. Monkeys require especially comprehensive enrichment programs, and we have a couple of videos to share with you today to showcase these. In these videos, you'll see monkeys wearing metal collars and sitting in specially made chairs. We take a lot of care and time to carefully and safely train monkeys to climb out of their enclosures, leading them by their collars with a pole. They're excited to sit in their chairs because we frequently provide them treats and snacks as positive reinforcement. And once sitting in their chair, they can move around to perform various tasks. You'll also see throughout these videos, laboratory staff wearing personal protective equipment, also known as PPE. We gear up in gloves, face masks, face shields, and laboratory coats to promote the health and welfare of our monkeys. Our monkeys are provided fresh fruits and vegetables every day, as well as a lot of treats and snacks. They also receive one-on-one -on -one interactions throughout the day, every day, from laboratory and care staff and veterinarians. In this first video, you can see a female and a male monkey sitting comfortably in their chairs. Each are being offered popcorn and animal crackers. Next, we see the same pair. This time, we offer them each a banana. Just like humans, they both have their own ways of eating their foods. And you might notice the balls under their jaws. Like many other monkey species, these rhesus macaques have cheek pouches, which allow them to temporarily store food. Also, just like humans, monkeys have their own food preferences. In the final clip, you can see that the male on the right is not interested in the pickle that he's offered, and the female on the left is not interested in the cookie. Hello, I'm Julia Taylor, laboratory supervisor for Dr. Charles France in the Department of Pharmacology at the UT Health Science Center here in San Antonio. I've worked in biomedical research for over 20 years, and most of that time has been spent working with laboratory animals, including zebrafish, mice, rats, and non-human primates. For the past three years, I've helped manage the daily operations of Dr. Francis' non-human primate behavioral pharmacology lab, where we study the effects of drugs on behavior and physiology. Non-human primates are instrumental in the development of medications to treat all kinds of disorders, including substance use disorders. In addition to working in the lab, one of my primary responsibilities is to help manage a project that is developing a new drug to treat opioid overdose and opioid use disorder, and our monkeys have played a valuable role in this process. You will hear more from Dr. France about this exciting new potential medication later on in the webinar. Since non-human primates are social animals, whenever possible, they are housed in pairs or groups. This isn't always possible, so laboratory animal enrichment programs are designed to create a stimulating environment to keep the animals happy, healthy, and engaged. In the following video, you'll see me interact with two of our pair-housed male rhesus monkeys and provide multiple forms of enrichment. As I mentioned previously, non-human primates and other laboratory animals are housed in larger cages or pens in pairs or groups whenever possible. If they are unable to be housed with a friend, we work extra hard to make their environment stimulating and exciting while still allowing the opportunity to see and interact with other animals. Here, you can see two pair housed males have given paper bags filled with treats, including popcorn, cereal, nuts, and seeds. You will notice that these monkeys also wear the same collars seen before to help us move them safely and comfortably from their home cage to their workspace. Although you can't tell from this video, they also have access to the bottom half of this large cage, which gives them lots of space to move around. You also see that I am wearing full personal protective equipment, or PPE, to protect the health and welfare of the monkeys. The white device hanging from the right side of the cage is a puzzle feeder, which makes gaining access to treats more mentally and physically challenging. The foraging board seen on the left promotes species typical activity patterns and provides multi-sensory stimulation. Monkeys get enrichment items like these on a daily basis, while the paper bags filled with preferred snacks are an extra special treat. 
They are also provided additional enrichment items, such as their favorite food and toys. And each room is equipped with a TV, so all the monkeys get to watch movies daily. Lastly, one of the most effective forms of enrichment for laboratory animals is the daily interaction they have with their care staff. I am providing this by engaging with each of the monkeys when handing out peanuts and grapes. This one-on-one -on -one interaction occurs every day by multiple people, including veterinarians and other care staff. Next, Dr. David McGuire will show you a monkey working on a touch screen. Hello, I'm David McGuire, Assistant Professor of Pharmacology here at UT Health San Antonio. And I've been working with animals in research for over 20 years, using a variety of species, from rats to mice, to monkeys, and even pigeons. Our research seeks to understand the behavioral and physiological consequences of drug use and to discover safe and effective treatments, which are desperately needed. Because of their similarities to humans, non-human primates have proven critical for studying extraordinarily complex effects that drugs can have. There are many sorts of tasks that we use. In the example shown in the following video, the monkey has to remember a symbol displayed on a screen in order to get a food pellet. We've adapted touch screens to be used with monkeys in their home cage their version of working from home. Initially, one symbol is shown in the middle of the screen. After several touches, it disappears momentarily and then reappears below along with another symbol. Selecting the matching symbol delivers a small reward, in this case, a raspberry flavored sugar pellet. Selecting the incorrect symbol leads to a short timeout. This monkey has just started training, so the task is not very difficult for him, and he earns a pellet almost every time. Later, we'll increase the time from initial presentation of the symbol when he has to make a choice to see how long he can remember. Since drug effects can depend on a variety of factors, including task difficulty, we can also make it more challenging by increasing the number of symbols available. This procedure, and many others like it, are widely used with animals in research to model the sorts of complex behaviors that humans engage in every day. Since one goal of our research program is developing medications for treating substance use disorders, we need to ensure that potential medications do not interfere with daily living, such as disrupting memory or ability to perform complex tasks. As you can see, we really love these monkeys and are passionate about the incredible research they are involved in. We hope you enjoyed seeing a real glimpse into their lives and the research facility. These animals contribute so much to medical advancements, and we're tremendously grateful for the opportunity to work with them. We hope you enjoy the rest of the webinar. back here awesome that was incredible thank you thank you to ut health san antonio the behavioral pharmacology group and to the monkeys um, for allowing us an inside look at animal research and know that these people are not used to being on camera they're not used to making videos for everyone and anyone to see um, but when asked if they would be willing to welcome us in and give us a look at their world they did not hesitate they are incredibly proud as they should be of the work that they do with these animals, the care that they provide them, and as you can see, the relationships that they form with the monkeys. It is really, really special, so thank you. Um, if you have any questions about that session, about, about the video, please put them in the chat and we can answer them at the end as well. Um, and now I am thrilled to introduce our speaker for the BRAD 2024 webinar, Dr. Charles France, who will share more about how non-human primates contribute to substance use disorder research. Uh, Dr. France is a Robert A. Welsh Distinguished University Chair in Chemistry and Professor in the Departments of Pharmacology and Psychiatry at UT Health San Antonio. He did undergraduate studies at Northland College and the University of Minnesota and received his Master's and PhD from the University of Michigan. After a postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard Medical School, he held faculty appointments at the University of Michigan, LSU Health Science Center in New Orleans, and UT Health San Antonio. He directs an NIH T32 postdoctoral training program and is the director of the Addiction Research Treatment and Training Center of Excellence. Having continuous NIH funding for more than 34 years, he has published more than 300 original research reports, chapters, and reviews, and has trained more than 100 high school undergraduate post and doctoral students, as well as 19 postdoctoral fellows. He holds several patents, and his laboratory has developed knowledge materials for evaluating abuse-related effects of drugs on humans. His laboratory has collaborated with and conducted many abuse liability studies for pharmaceutical and biotech companies. He was elected counselor, then secretary treasurer, then president 
of the American Society for Pharmacology and Experimental Therapeutics, and he was the recipient of both a KO2 Research Career Award and a KO5 Senior Scientist Award from NIDA. Professor France has been a member and chair of numerous NIH and VA study sections. He is a fellow in the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology and the American Psychological Association, and he is currently an associate editor for Pharmacological Reviews. And you may have noticed that Dr. France and I have something in common, which is our last name. Uh, in addition to his long list of accomplishments, Dr. France also holds an extra special title, which is my dad. Um, he has been part of animal research, and I have been lucky enough to grow up in the world of animal research and see firsthand the care and the dedication that scientists like my dad provide to the animals. And uh, truly, without him, I wouldn't be a laboratory animal veterinarian, and Brad certainly wouldn't exist today, so it really is an honor and a privilege to have him with us. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to my dad, Dr. France. Thank you, Logan. Thank you for the kind introduction, and thank you for your support, uh, the use of animals in research. You're really a very dedicated person. I really admire that in you. I also want to thank Paula and AMP for this opportunity to talk to you about some of the work we're doing. I certainly want to thank uh, Dr. Gyalbo-Toma, Dr. McGuire, and uh, Julie uh, for doing that video, and for uh, Lindsay's husband, Kevin, for putting it together. That was a very nice peek into our laboratory. It's an honor to present the Brad webinar this ninth annual. Um, it's especially an honor because of Logan's initiation of this project. There are many dedicated scientists who are working tirelessly to solve problems in the mental health arena, including the substance use disorder arena. Uh, and you're only going to hear a little bit of that today, and that's going to give you a glimpse of what we're doing in our lab and uh, some of the work that we think is really exciting for new medication. I'll get to that at the end. Now, before I do, I have to provide my disclosures. I'm a co-holder of a U.S. patent for a drug called methocinamox. I'll refer to it as MCAM, and I'll talk about it later in the presentation. I'm also an inventor on three pending patents for the same molecule, and I'm a principal investigator on NIH grants supporting this work. I'm going to have three parts to my presentation today. I'm just going to tell you about a problem that you're all already keenly aware of, substance use disorders. I'm going to give you an example of the kinds of methods that we use in non-human species to evaluate certain aspects of substance use disorders, and then I'm going to tell you about this current drug development program that we're really very excited about. I, I get to tell you the story today, but it's a lot of other people who have done the hard work on this, and I have to give them acknowledgement on this slide. Some of them are shown here from uh, my university on the left-hand side, and I especially want to thank again Lindsay, David, and Julia for putting together that wonderful video. But also Jim Woods, my colleague, uh, without whom this um, project I'll tell you about later would not have advanced because it was really Jim's idea to move this compound forward. Uh, you'll see names of research assistants. We've had many terrific research assistants in this lab, and we now have perhaps the best cohort we've ever had, Gabriel, Jordan, Kim, Matthew, and Sam. They're the ones who deal with those monkeys every day, collect the data, and uh, really treat them marvelously, along with our veterinarians and the animal staff. NIDA has supported much of the work I'm going to talk to you about today. There are a number of people shown here from NIDA, especially Jane Ackrey has been our guiding light through much of this process. And the drug development program I'll tell you about at the end exists only because of Dan Deaver, who has been holding our hand throughout this challenging process. So first of all, the problem is one that's touched probably everybody who's on this webinar today, and it is substance use disorders. There are more than 3 million people in the U.S., and 47 million of those, that's 17% of the population, 12 years and older, report having had a substance use disorder in the past year. It's a massive number of people. It affects adolescents, those 12 to 17, certainly young adults, perhaps the most vulnerable population, but also the elderly as well. Uh, not shown on this slide is the fact that the overdose rate in people 65 years and older has quadrupled in the United States in the last 10 years. And it's a massive drain on our income, up to 6% of the U.S. Uh, income is, is spent on tobacco, alcohol, and illicit drug use. It's not just costly in terms of money, it's costly in terms of lives, and you know that as well from the staggering number you see every day in the newspaper. This slide shows you the maximum number of deaths recorded for each of these three events, automobile accidents, guns, and drugs. So automobiles, that peaked back in 1972 with nearly 55,000. Guns, early in the pandemic, with nearly 48,000. Add those two together and you still don't get to the maximum number of drug deaths 
estimated in 2021 at nearly 170,000. It's a massive problem and it's a complicated problem. Many factors contribute to substance use disorders. And you can only capture some of those in, in the laboratory uh, in which I'm going to talk about today. But it is a treatable and a preventable disease. We have drugs that are effective in many people. They're, they're shown here. We have three drugs that can be used for opioid use disorder, methadone, naltrexone, and buprenorphine. Also for smoking cessation, nicotine itself, bupropion and varenicline, and for alcohol use disorder. However, we, we have been thinking, some of us as a society, about medicines as magic bullets and things that can solve diseases. But the things we're talking about, like substance use disorders, are far too complicated to presume that a single drug is going to solve the problem. And that's clear from the fact that we still have an opioid problem. Note that methadone has been around for more than 50 years, naltrexone for more than 40, and buprenorphine for more than 20. And we still have, in the one hour I'm going to speak to you today, about a dozen people die in this country from an overdose. So we clearly need more and better medications. We need greater access to medications. There's no doubt about it. We're in the fourth phase of this drug epidemic. It started long ago, earlier in the century, with misuse of prescription opioids that morphed into the use of heroin because heroin became very available from Mexico. It was cheap. That was supplanted by fentanyl and its analogs. Uh, and there are many of them which are very potent, very easy to make, very toxic chemicals. And we're now in the fourth wave, which is a mixture of fentanyl with other drugs largely stimulant drugs, as you can see from this reported death rate. This is an especially challenging situation because unlike some other substance use disorders, there are no FDA approved medications for stimulant use disorder. It's not for want of trying. The NIH and many dedicated investigators have spent many, many years working on this problem, but have yet to come up with an adequate solution for treating stimulant use, use disorder. It's also complicated by the fact that Polysubstance use is now the norm. That is to say, people use more than one substance either concurrently or, or, or sequentially. Most opioid stimulant users use nicotine or alcohol. Half of those people who are coming in to be treated for opioid use disorder are also using a stimulant. And among those who die from an opioid overdose, a large fraction of them also have a stimulant on board. So it's an especially challenging problem in terms of developing medications. As evidenced by this quote from the director of the National Institute of Drug Abuse, Dr. Volkov, a few years ago in her web, noting that the best treatment for stimulant use disorder is a behavioral invention because there are no approved indications. The goals of what we try to accomplish here in the non-human uh, behavioral pharmacology laboratory with regard to substance use disorder research is to first of all understand the causes of substance use disorders. What are the risk factors? How might we prevent it? Secondly, to understand the consequences of that substance use disorder and hopefully to discover and develop treatments for specific disorders. And I'll tell you about one example later. Something I won't have time to talk about today is we also evaluate new medications for abuse liability for pharmaceutical companies, biotech, and for regulatory agencies to see if the compounds that are being developed are likely to be abused if made available to humans. Second part of the talk, I'll give you an example of a few of the procedures that we use in the non-human primate laboratory to capture various aspects of substance use disorders. And the first one is reward. Uh, it starts with a quiz. Can you tell me which one of these critters has a substance use disorder? I'll give you just a moment to think about it. You're probably having a bit of a challenge. It's this guy in the bottom right. And of course, the point of this slide is that we really can't tell by looking at monkeys any better than we can tell by looking at human beings what their mental health condition is. The challenge with us in the non-human primate laboratory is we're trying to answer complicated questions without the verbal behavior that we have the luxury of having with human patients. And despite that, a lot has been learned about substance use disorders, mostly by designing sophisticated experiments that tap into various aspects that capture substance use disorder. We learned a lot about sensitization, that is increased sensitivity to drugs. Tolerance, decreased sensitivity, about physical dependence, that's very important with alcohol and some other drugs. We know a lot about the progression from drug use to drug misuse to substance use disorders. Many people sample drugs, only a fraction of those develop a substance use disorder. We've learned about genetics, how the brain is wired and how that wiring is changed by drugs, about sex differences and about vulnerability. 
unlike many mental health disorders that are studied and modeled in the laboratory, we have the advantage within substance use disorders, if you want to call it an advantage, that non-humans take drugs just like humans. And the drugs that non-humans take are pretty much the same drugs that humans would take. There are some, some variations in that, but not many. That line of thinking sort of began many, many years ago. And this is one example from Dr. Sprague, who was doing a very comprehensive study on the effects of morphine in chimpanzees. He chose chimpanzees because they were the closest thing to humans and therefore were going to translate best to humans. And it was a very comprehensive behavioral uh, examination of morphine. But one of the things he observed here was he thought that the monkeys appeared, the chimpanzees appeared to like the morphine injections. They would seek him out. They would come to the place where they received injections. He actually did things like put a syringe in a box and put a piece of food in another box. And the chimpanzees would often select the syringe. And he generally observed that he thought there was a biological basis to these chimpanzees seeking out the morphine. And he said that morphine addiction was not dependent on personality. And, and then and even today, some people think that substance use disorders represent a moral weakness. Well, well they don't. They represent a biological effect. Addiction has a firm organic basis, as Dr. Sprague said, and he called it a physiogenic phenomenon. That speculation was underscored experimentally by Dr. Weeks in 1962 in an experiment where rats that had an intravenous catheter could press a lever to get intravenous infusions of morphine. And they did so very avidly. They really responded rapidly for morphine, clearly indicating that the drug had some rewarding effect even in a rat, not because of a moral failing. This procedure has been used very widely in many different species, and the predictability across species is really a very, very powerful tool for what we do in the laboratory. We do this in non-human primates. These, these rhesus monkeys have an indwelling intravenous catheter, and when a light comes on, they can press a lever to get an intravenous infusion of drug. And as I noted earlier, they like to take the same drugs that humans like. Here's a dose response curve for fentanyl. What this shows you on the left-hand coordinate here are the number of infusions they receive in a 90-minute session as a function of different unit doses of fentanyl. So as we increase the dose of fentanyl, they respond more and more, uh, reaching a maximum of about 25 infusions in a session. They do that for other drugs in, in addition to opioids. Here's co a cocaine dose response curve, again with the monkeys getting about 25 infusions in a session. Now in this kind of experiment, the monkeys have to press the lever 30 times to get a single infusion. But we can modify this procedure to look at the strength of how these drugs reward behavior by asking the animals to make increasing amounts of responses across successive infusions. And that's what's shown on this slide. So with each progressive infusion, the number of responses required increases, and it increases quite dramatically, as you'll see. These are data, again, showing the infusions received on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, how many responses the monkeys had to make to get those infusions. For cocaine and methamphetamine, two drugs you recognize. You may not recognize the others, the so-called bath salts. These are also drugs that, uh, that are widely misused. And the point of this slide is to show you that monkeys will emit somewhere between 1,000 to up to 3,000 lever presses for a single infusion of drug, demonstrating the biological power of drugs as reinforcers. And, and this is really an amazing uh, a task that has been used to learn many important things about substance use disorders. You might wonder why we're using non-human primates. There's a host of reasons. I'll share just some of them with you. The response to drugs is very similar to what humans show. Their pharmacokinetics, that is how they metabolize drugs, how they're eliminated, is most similar to humans. In some cases we use other species, but most commonly rhesus monkeys. We can study drugs by multiple routes of administration. That's important because humans misuse drugs by multiple routes of administration. Monkeys live a long time. In our laboratory, they live 30 or more years. And, and the lifespan of those monkeys gives us the opportunity to study things we otherwise could not study. Substance use disorder is a chronic problem. So we can do longevity studies in non-human primates that simply are not possible in other species. And finally, they have an incredibly rich behavioral record. Dr. McGuire gave you an example moments ago of a monkey in the early stages of learning a task. But you could train these animals to do very complicated tasks that nicely model what goes on in humans to look at potential adverse effects of new medications that were developed. Now, getting people to stop taking drugs is one significant task, but to get them to stop, to not start taking drugs again, is turning out to be perhaps the more challenging task, and that is relapse. And relapse has been captured in the laboratory using a number of different procedures, and I'll just give you an example of one that we use, and uh, it's called a reinstatement procedure. 
This is a cartoon of what happens in a typical self-administration procedure showing responses on the left as a function of sessions. The monkeys learn the task. That's the sloped line on the right showing acquisition. And once they learn it, they respond at a very steady rate across many, many days, self-administering drug. And they do that in the presence of distinctive visual stimuli. In this case, uh, three different colored lights. So if they press the lever 30 times in the presence of the lights, they get an infusion of drug. We then take away the drug, we take away the lights, there's no drug reward, and as you might expect, the monkeys stop pressing the levers. That would go essentially down to zero. We can then examine what the impact is of those environmental conditions in which the animal previously took drug to see if they stimulate responding, just as a human might relapse to drug use when put back into an environment in which they have previously taken drug. And that's what's shown here on the right again in cartoon fashion. So there's no drug reinforcement here. There's no IV infusions after the lever pressing, but the monkeys nevertheless will press it, will press the lever simply to see the lights that have previously been appeared with the injection. We can also give them a free dose of the drug before the session. Again, there's no reward. Pressing the lever doesn't lead to drug, and that too will stimulate responding. Or you could combine the two, the lights and that free injection before the session, stimulating even more behavior. So this models a relapse to drug taking that may occur in humans. And I'll give you one data example of that. These are data showing the number of responses monkeys make in a 90 minute session. These animals previously self administered either heroin or cocaine, but here all they get is a single dose before session. And if they respond on the labor, what they get is a flash of light. They don't get any drug reward. We use that to see whether drugs might block that behavior and therefore be useful in blocking relapse. This is one drug we were studying a number of years ago, lorcasserin, and in fact, it was very effective at blocking that relapse behavior. Unfortunately, lorcasserin, which was then on the market, was removed from the market because of other health risks. But this is the kind of model we can use to look at drugs that might attenuate relapse and therefore uh, prevent people reinitiating drug use. The third kind of procedure I'll tell you about is, is impulsivity, and this is a very important aspect of substance use disorders as well. If, if you were here and I asked you whether you wanted $50 now or $150 now, I, I dare say most of all of you would say I'd take $150 now. If I said you have to wait a month for the $150, you might say, well, that's still good enough. That's a pretty good chunk of change. If I said three months, you might think about where is this France guy going to be in three months, six months again. You get the point. As the delivery of that larger reinforcer is delayed, its value is reduced. It's no more valuable, valuable than $50 now. And we can, we can plot that, and it's different for different people, and it's different for different reinforcers, and we get this delay function, whereby things that are otherwise really reinforcing become less reinforcing. And this applies to many things in life, the immediacy of drug reward that you get when you take a drug versus the delayed reinforcement, perhaps, of good health, a good job, and better relations with your family. And to the extent that those extended delayed reinforcers become less valuable, we say that people are more impulsive. We can study that in the laboratory. We know that impulsivity can lead to drug use. These are risk-taking individuals and that drug use can, propose, can uh, facilitate impulsivity. So we model this in the lab with smaller, sooner reinforcers versus larger, later reinforcers. We can do that with monkeys. Monkeys like food, they like drugs. We don't use bananas, that would be messy, but we do use food pellets. So this is an experiment with a monkey pressing lever A, they get one food pellet, pressing lever B, two food pellets, they choose two. If we delay those two food pellets, eventually the animals begin to work for one. By two minutes, they're completely indifferent. And by 240 seconds, they're now selecting one food pellet over two food pellets. We've devalued the two food pellets by delaying them in time. We can do the same with drugs large dose versus a small dose. Monkeys will always take the large dose. It's more reinforcing. We delay that large dose sufficiently. Monkeys are quite happy to worry, work for the immediate small dose rather than the delayed large dose. We can combine reinforcers. That more closely models what happens in the real world. People don't choose between large doses and big doses usually. We choose between drug and other reinforcers. So this is an experiment with food and drug. And we start out with food versus saline in the, in the syringe, and obviously monkeys don't self-administer saline, so they choose the food. If we give an opioid at a sufficiently large dose, we get them to prefer the opioid, and that's not surprising. We can then ask the question of whether we can reduce that preference for the opioid by delaying its delivery. That's shown here in the right-hand panel. 
for the opioid is now preferred with no delay, but as we increase the delay, the delivery of that infusion, the animal begin to work for the food, and eventually the food becomes preferred to an otherwise preferred dose of drug. So delaying reinforcement is a very important factor, and this is an important part of drug development in terms of having compounds that don't maybe have an immediate onset so as to reduce their use liability. Lastly, I'm going to just briefly tell you about a drug development program that utilizes some of the procedures I've talked to you about today uh, to develop a medication that we think can really make an impact on public health. As you all know, opioids decrease breathing. They suppress ventilation, and that's how they predominantly kill. It's, it's, it's uh, the way in which we have to deal with opioid toxicity. The good news is we have a drug called Naloxone. You probably know it as Narcan. It is very effective at reversing opioid overdose. That's the good news. The less good news is that Naloxone doesn't last very long, about an hour. And many drugs, many opioids that are used have a much longer duration of action. Things like extended release oxycodone and related drugs can last eight hours or longer. So that's a problem. The short acting naloxone can wear off. The long acting opioid can still be there. Their effect reemerges. This is called renarcanization, and this can lead to death and requires the readministration of naloxone. And there are certain clinical cases where many, many doses of naloxone had to be given. In fact, cases where individuals had to be put on an intravenous infusion of naloxone because they had accidentally ingested a very lethal dose of fentanyl or related compound. So we were interested in whether we could have an antagonist that would not only reverse that respiratory depression, but provide extended protection. This is a picture of John Lewis. John Lewis reported first on this drug, methocinamox, I'll call it MCAM, in 1988 in a, in a research monograph. And he's an important person, not just because of this drug, because he was also the inventor of buprenorphine, which is the first line treatment for people with opioid use disorder. And that drug, MCAM, was used by a couple of laboratories in the next couple of decades as a research tool. And it wasn't until 2017 when my colleague Jim Woods, who was here in San Antonio, said, you know, this might be something worth looking at in terms of treating opioid use disorder. So Jim had some of the compound. We began studying it. And that's where our journey began with MCAM. Our first question was, does it block the respiratory depressive effects of opioids? We study breathing in monkeys. Their only obligation to the experiment is to breathe. And uh, we use a pressure transducer to look at the depth and frequency of breathing. And this shows you breathing on the left-hand coordinate here, expressed as a percentage of what happens under control conditions. In this experiment, the monkeys received a dose of heroin that decreased breathing quite markedly. So they're breathing slowly and shallow. And note that heroin decreases breathing throughout this 60-minute session. As expected, naloxone reverses that, and it does so fully by 15 minutes. However, the effects of naloxone begin to wane within the 60-minute session. The heroin is still there, the naloxone is going away, and this is the renarcanization that I indicated to you earlier. Indeed, MCAM reverses the respiratory depression by heroin, and it does so not just for a short period of time, but for the duration of this 60-minute session. And in fact, it does it for much longer. This is another experiment in which, again, heroin decreased breathing, again, to a very low level. MCAM reversed that completely, and that single dose of MCAM, the next day, still blocked heroin. Two days, or, I'm sorry, four days after MCAM, heroin was still largely without effect. And by day eight, after that single dose of MCAM, heroin is now beginning to have effect. So indeed, it has not only the ability to reverse respiratory depression, but to provide extended protection. And this is important because people who have previously been rescued with naloxone are very likely to die within the next year, many of them because of another drug overdose. These are some data from a study in Massachusetts, and there are a lot of data like this, showing uh, the number of deaths that occur from people who are released from the emergency department after having been rescued from an opioid overdose. You can see most of them died within 24 hours, and most of those are from a drug overdose death, but it continues for the next month. So these people are at a hugely increased risk for opioid overdose, and there's a wealth of information showing that there is this window of, of vulnerability when individuals need to be protected. It's not just people who've been rescued before, but there are other people who could use protection with an opioid receptor antagonist like MCAM. People who live in rural communities who have no access to health care. They don't see a physician regularly, much less an addiction, addiction psychiatrist. People who are unhoused are at greater risk. People with serious mental illness, we know that there's 
the huge comorbidity between substance use disorders and mental illness. Mothers who have had an opioid use disorder are at increased risk of opioid overdose during postpartum challenges. And a very big problem that we're not dealing with effectively is all, at all with people released from incarceration, from prison or jail. If they have used opioids previously, they have a massively increased risk of overdose, especially shortly after them in prison. If they could be protected with a drug like MCAM, we could reduce the number of deaths. So does MCAM block these effects? It, it does. It blocks them and it protects against them very well. So our notion here is that MCAM would be as effective or more effective than naloxone in many situations, with naloxone lasting not more than an hour and MCAM lasting days or weeks. The next question was, does MCAM block the rewarding effects of opioids? Can it be used as a treatment for people who have suffered from opioid use disorder? And for that, we use the self-administration procedure I mentioned to you earlier. Again, monkeys press a little bit of times to get an intravenous infusion of drug. I showed you they do that for fentanyl, and they did again in this experiment that's shown by the blue square. In a 90-minute session, they're taking somewhere between 20 and 25 infusions. If saline is in the syringe rather than fentanyl, you can see that they take very few infusions. They'll sample it, and then they'll sit for the rest of the session. A single injection of MCAM decreases this fentanyl self-administration down to essentially saline values. And that single dose of MCAM continues to do so for a very long time. It's not until a couple of weeks after that single dose of MCAM that the monkeys start working again for fentanyl. And as a group, it's not until nearly a month that their sensitivity to fentanyl in terms of self-administration has recovered. It's not that they can't respond. You'll note that there are breaks in these lines between these squares. And on those intervening days, the monkeys had the opportunity to self-administer cocaine, which I showed you earlier. They also self-administer. It's not an opioid. You wouldn't expect MCAM, MCAM to affect it, and it doesn't. They responded very avidly for cocaine on those intervening days. Now, for a drug to be an effective medication, we need to know that it's going to be effective over an extended period of time, over repeated administration. So in the next experiment, MCAM was given every 12 days over a couple of months to see if it continued to suppress fentanyl self-administration. And it did, leaving the cocaine self-administration, indicated by the red circles, completely intact. And again, after the last dose of MCAM, the monkeys require, uh, the monkeys um, uh, recover. In fact, this slide shows you the recovery and sensitivity to fentanyl, again, the number of infusions that they take after MCAM. Purple triangles being monkeys that got one dose of MCAM, squares being monkeys that got the five doses I just showed you. They recover in the same way. And this is important because it indicates that the opioid system, if you will, is not perturbed in any long lasting way by the long term administration of MCAM. So, does it block the rewarding effects? It sure does. Question is, well, just how effective is it? What I showed you was a single dose of fentanyl being suppressed. We did more quantitative studies to get a sense of what, how big that antagonism is. And this is a slightly more complicated study, but I'll walk you through it. This again is the fentanyl dose response curve. And at this biggest dose of fentanyl, that the monkeys are taking about 22 infusions of a unit dose of 0.32 micrograms per kilogram, they take in a total of about nine micrograms per kilogram of fentanyl in a 90 minute session. That's a modest dose. It's well below the doses where we begin to see effects on breeding in monkeys. In this experiment, then, monkeys received a dose of MCAM every day over many months with the dose of MCAM slowly increasing, which resulted in a shift to the right in the fentanyl dose response curve. And as MCAM was blocking fentanyl, the monkeys were able to take much larger doses in the self-administration experiment. Here, for example, the curve has shifted more than 124 to the right. When the monkeys took this largest unit dose of fentanyl, 100 micrograms per kilogram, it's a very large dose, and they were taking 10 to 15 infusions of it, they received more than 1,000 micrograms per kilogram of fentanyl in that session. That's three times the lethal dose, actually more than three times the lethal dose of fentanyl. And the monkeys looked completely undrugged. You would have no idea they had received anything. It provides a dramatic example of just how effective MCAM is in blocking the effects of fentanyl. Does it impact the effects of food? We know that opioid systems can impact food intake, so we had to do that experiment. It's slightly different from the last one. The monkey presses one lever, they get a drug infusion. If they press the other lever, they get a pellet of food. If you arrange the situation just right, they'll be indifferent for it. They'll respond half for food and half for opioid. We give them MCAM. 
they indeed stop working for opioid as they did in the previous experiment, but they increase working for food. So it's simply a reallocation of their behavior and that recovers after a few days. Bigger dose of MCAM, the same thing. The monkeys lose their interest in fentanyl, but they will quite happily respond for food. So no, it does not impact responding for food. It's selective. It selectively blocks the rewarding effects of opioids, and it does it for two weeks or longer. We think this drug is going to fill an unmet need for preventing relapse and overdose. It's very potent. It's selective. It lasts a long time. It doesn't last very long in the blood. I haven't shown you those data, but we don't think it has anything to do with hanging around in the body. We think it has something to do with acting in the brain. It's effective over a very wide range of conditions in multiple species. We studied it over a 10,000 fold dose range. Doesn't affect cognition or memory on the kinds of tasks you saw earlier. Uh, and it doesn't affect physiology in terms of heart rate, blood pressure, body temperature. So proof of principle, we think, is very strong for this compound. But developing drugs is a very expensive and long-term process. Many years, billions B of dollars, and few drugs that actually get into a phase one clinical trial of humans are actually FDA approved. We are standing at that doorstep with this compound. If all goes according to plan, we hope to have a submission of investigation, new drug application. I'll tell you about that in just a moment to the FDA very shortly. And if that happens, we'll have the MCAM in patients, we hope, in the very near future. But it's a huge undertaking. This is where we are at the moment. This is the drug development process from early discovery to preclinical studies. That's where we've been working the eventual clinical development. The IND is essentially a request to the FDA to allow you to the drug into humans for safety studies, what's called the phase one, phase one safety clinical study. And the IND has three components. The top right here is manufacturing. Can you make it reliable? Can you make it clean? Um, have you documented all of the processes of making it? That's not a small undertaking for a drug like MCAM. The bottom component, component talks about the clinical protocols. Who are you going to give it to? How are you going to give it to them? Who's going to manage it? Who's going to have the clinical affairs to make sure that this is a safe protocol? And the last component is the pharmacology and pharmacology. And this is where animals and research are absolutely critical because the large component of that comes from studies that have been conducted in rats and dogs and mice and rhesus monkeys on the feasibility of using MCAM to address the opioid crisis. So there have been three parts of my talk. I've gone through that quickly. I hope you've gotten the nuggets. First of all, there's a problem. I didn't have to tell you about that, but the opiate epidemic rages, the substance use disorder epidemic rages with polydrug use as we're facing it today. Use of subjects, non-human subjects is incredibly valuable. The translation of what we can learn in the non-human laboratory to the human is very, very strong and gives us significant power in terms of developing new medications. And lastly, I told you about MCAM. We think that this is a drug that has the potential to save lives. And we hope that we can get this into people soon enough to test the proof of principle in the organism that really counts. Thank you for your time. And with that, uh, thank you, Brad. And I'd be happy to entertain any questions or comments. Awesome. Thank you, Dad. Thank you, Dr. France. Excellent talk. Um, and we do have some questions. So.